Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce that we have a speaker by DeepMind, Petar Vilichkovich. So Petar is a senior research scientist at DeepMind. He holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Cambridge, Trinity College, obtained under the supervision of Pietro Leo. His research interests involve devising neural network architectures that operate on non-trivially structured data such as graphs, and their application in algorithmic reasoning and computational biology. He published relevant research in these areas at both machine learning venues, NeurIPS, ICLR, ICMLW, and biomedical venues and journals, Bioinformatics, PLOS One, JCP, and Pervasive Health. In particular, he is the first author of Graph Attention Networks, a popular convolutional layer for graphs, and Deep Graph Infomax, a scalable local global unsupervised learning pipeline for graphs, which was also featured in ZDNet. Further, his research has been used in substantially improving the travel time predictions in Google Maps, which was covered by outlets including CNBC, and Gadget, VentureBeat, CNET, The Verge and ZDNet. So you see that Petar is a really inspiring and popular researcher from DeepMind and it's a great pleasure to have him here today. And it's an even more great pleasure today because today is also the release date of his book that he's co-offering with Michael Bronstein and other colleagues, Geometric Deep Learning, which will be available just right after the recording of this presentation. So the talk is also entitled after the book, Geometric Deep Learning, Grids, Graphs, Groups, Geodesics and Gorges. So Petar, I'm very much looking forward to the presentation and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Andreas, for the fine introduction and uh, for inviting me to speak to you all today. It is actually a great pleasure to be virtually speaking at Erlangen, and uh, I hope that you will find uh, my talk content uh, interesting and a fun way to both synthesize interesting ideas in machine learning and also to uh, kind of link back to the early days of geometry. So. Uh, I'm starting this talk in a bit of an unconventional form. We, I don't have a title slide yet. We're actually going to start by going back in time and uh, quite back in time, like potentially uh, 300 years BC or so in the time of Euclid when the original foundations of geometry were first uh, laid out. And uh, actually for a very long time, Euclid and his Euclidean geometry were the way to do geometry. Uh, just generally within mathematics. And suddenly in the 1800s, uh, we experienced this boom of alternate geometries that were uh, uh, proposed as an alternative to Euclidean geometry, such as the um, hyperbolic geometry of Lobachevsky and Bolyai and the elliptic geometry of Riemann. And with this big wealth of geometries being proposed left, right and center, The 19th century was certainly a super exciting time to study geometry, but it also led people to question what is the one true geometry? There's all these different geometries. They're all each individually consistent and they all lead to like individual theories. What is the actual like unifying principle? What's the geometry that we should be looking at? And uh, a solution for this problem, a very In, in an imaginative solution out of this problem was given by uh, a young professor by the name of Felix Klein in his inaugural talk at this very university, uh, which uh, subsequently became known as the Erlangen program. So in this uh, 
inaugural talk, Felix talked about uh, a blueprint that would allow us to eventually unify the geometries that were known and proposed at the time using the lens of invariances and symmetries and uh, using the group theory formalism to uh, kind of expressively talk about the links between different geometries and how we might observe them. So in that sense, it's very, as I mentioned, very exciting for me to be speaking at this, uh, this very university, kind of linking back to uh, the work of Felix Klein. Um, and it shouldn't be, uh, it cannot be overstated that this program had a very strong impact on geometry. Uh, eventually, through the work of uh, Eli Cartan in the 1920s, all of these different geometries were unified under this invariances and symmetry lens. It had a very, very effective spillover uh, effect in physics with uh, the work of Emmy Noether and uh, showing in Noether's theorem that all the conservation laws in physics are completely derivable from symmetry. And uh, within theoretical computer science, the impact of the Erlangen program was quite, uh, quite magnificent. In fact, the very field of category theory, in the words of the creators of category theory, is that you can think of category theory as a continuation of uh, Klein's Erlangen program. So definitely a super impactful uh, uh, synthesis of existing work on geometry that had far-reaching impacts uh, well beyond its original intent. Now let's go way forward, roughly the year 2020, 2021, and uh, the most recent craze uh, of deep learning that has been going on for several uh, years now. And uh, the huge zoo of different architectures that are being proposed to solve machine learning problems. So uh, you may see people coming around with statements like everything can be represented as a convolutional neural network, um, everything is a graph neural network, uh, tr transformers are attention and attention is all you need, and uh, uh, long short-term memory is uh, Turing complete, so why would you need anything else? So we have a lot of these different very exciting ideas being proposed, and each one of these ideas has sort of a claim to being the one true architecture that we should be using when we're uh, performing uh, computations in machine learning and specifically deep learning. So uh, the field of deep learning, uh, circa 2020, feels a lot like geometry in the 1800s. And we might be now asking ourselves the question, what is the one-two architecture? And this is what inspired us to uh, go back in time, revisit these guiding principles, and basically now it's our turn to study geometry. So... Uh, my name is Petr Valichkovic, and alongside Michael Bronstein, John Bruna, and Taku Cohen, we have set out to do exactly this. And this is the talk that I will be giving you today uh, of how we tried to humbly take the ideas from uh, Klein's Erlangen program and apply them to the current state of affairs in uh, deep learning, hopefully in a way that will generalize to the architectures that haven't yet been proposed. So... Before we jump into the specifics of how we've done this, I, I want to just start by revisiting some of the foundational principles on why deep learning in itself is a very challenging problem and why we might need to even go to geometry for help. So one very uh, clear principle of uh, machine learning and especially deep learning recently has been learning these high dimensional latent representations. So this requires you to fit a function in very large numbers of dimensions, but uh, apparently this is a cursed estimation problem. So as you increase the number of dimensions that you need to fit, the, um, the number of samples that you need to accurately fit this could grow exponentially. And here, and this is the case, even if you restrict yourself to super simple target functions like uh, the class of one Lipschitz functions. Uh, here you can see this uh, example of many Lipschitz bumps in many dimensions that require exponentially more samples for you to properly fit this with the machine learning approach. So basically, the very setting of deep learning and high dimensional uh, uh, curve fitting is a bit of a cursed estimation problem. So it's a bit troubling to start with. And uh, one thing that you could do as an immediate response to that is, okay, we could just project everything to lower dimensions. And uh, in, that case, in that sense, we could try to apply low dimensional learning. 
But this doesn't always necessarily help because this, unless your manifold of data is nicely mappable to a hyperplane or something like this, it's very likely that if you do a low dimensional linear projection, uh, not unlike the kinds of linear layers an MLP might do, you could end up losing a lot of fidelity of their inputs. So here's the example of MNIST digits living on a Swiss roll. When you apply this uh, uh, simple linear projection, you might still be able to discern in this MNIST case that you're looking at digits, but already a lot of information about these digits is lost by doing so. So high dimensional learning is cursed and low dimensional learning is not always the right option. So what can we do in this case? And that leads us to the study of symmetries, groups and invariances, and then from there describing the state of the art of deep learning uh, at this particular day and age. So first of all, uh, geometry can come to the rescue in the sense that we can inject further assumptions about the geometry uh, through the use of uh, inductive biases, which effectively will uh, restrict our function, our hypothesis space, to uh, the functions that will respect the underlying geometry. And this can obviously make the high dimensional problem more tractable because now the space of solutions we're searching for is much smaller. Some popular examples of the geometries we might want to uh, induce is the uh, on image data. You want your uh, output to be independent usually of whether or not you've shifted the image. If your data lives on a sphere, as in the case of the smiley face, no matter how I rotate it along the sphere, it should still be the same smiley face. So independently of rotations, I should get the same answer. And uh, on graph data, which is something that I've personally been more involved in, um, you should be able to process the data independently of any isomorphisms of the graph. So these two graphs I've drawn here are exactly the same graph, just observed under a different uh, viewpoint. But I should get the same answer for these two. So having in mind that we can exploit some interesting geometry of our data to limit the solution space and hence make the problem more tractable, let's now see if we can formalize this whole idea of inductive biases. So the key elements we will use is that we'll assume our data lives on a domain that we will call omega. And for images, elements of this domain are pixels. And for graphs, the elements of the domain will be nodes. And we'll call these domain elements hue. We'll also assume a feature space that will store the features in every single element of the domain. So for example, the RGB values of every pixel or any node features in a graph. Um, for our purposes, we'll just assume this feature space is the k-dimensional real numbers, just to keep things easy. And it maps to most deep learning applications. And once we have these two terms, we can define uh, what it means for a domain to be uh, featureized by defining this uh, feature function x that uh, is the space of all functions uh, such that uh, it takes an element from the domain and gives you its featureization. Uh, very often the environments we'll be looking at will be discrete so we don't actually have to think of x as a function we can just think of it as a feature matrix so something of the shape number of domain elements by the number of features and the i throw of this uh, matrix x will take tell you uh, what is the domain element you're currently looking at and what are its features. So this is sort of just uh, a wrap up of these preliminaries on uh, what the uh, um, on what the uh, uh, these signals are and how we can define them. And uh, in particular, it should be uh, constructed in a way that it satisfies the distributivity property. So if I have two scalars multiplied by these feature functions and add them together, it should be the same as if uh, I individually scaled up the outputs and added them back together. And uh, also, if we have a good measure on this domain, some mu, we can integrate with respect to the elements of the domain. And as a result, we can also compute inner products between two different functions uh, giving us features on the domain. Uh, this is not something to keep in mind immediately, but it might become useful as we try to generalize our blueprint to more interesting uh, spaces other than images and graphs. So just keep in mind that if we can define a nice measure over our domain, we can then integrate with respect to the domain and conversely compute these inner products x, y between two different feature functions. OK, so there's a few guiding principles once we have the preliminaries that we can use. The first one is the idea of symmetry groups. So 
what I mean when I say a symmetry is it's a transformation that leaves the underlying object invariant that is unchanged. So in the case of images, if I shift the image, I'm assuming that it doesn't change what's actually in the image, for example. And because the symmetry leaves an object unchanged, then by definition, just mathematically, you must be able to compose different symmetries and get a new symmetry. You must be able to invert symmetries, otherwise information will be lost. And the identity transformation must be a trivial symmetry just by definition. And when you come up with all these different uh, properties that a symmetry must satisfy, you can uh, figure out that actually it forms a very nice mathematical object called the group. And uh, we'll think of elements of these groups as the main transformations. So these will be uh, fracture G functions that take the domain elements to a different domain element such that the, I'm still looking at the same object. So on the left-hand side, I've just listed all the axioms for what it means for a set and an operation to form a group. Uh, in this case, it's like a composition of symmetries and each symmetry is a group element. And there are some things that must satisfy like being associative, invertible and uh, closed. And also the identity transformation must be in the, in the group. And here on the right-hand side, I've given an example of these triangles uh, with uh, three features in the three corners of the triangle. And uh, the two symmetries that we can do on this triangle so that it's still representing the same object is we can flip it horizontally, that's the F, and we can also rotate it, that's the R. And you can basically draw all the possible triangles that you can get as a result, which are still underneath representing the same triangle. And this gives you a nice diagram representing the entire symmetry group. So just to be clear, the individual points on a triangle are elements of omega and the uh, uh, rotation itself is what we will consider a group element. And we'll be doing algebra over these different transformations. Okay, so once we've defined the concept of a group, which seems to be a very similar, uh, a very useful one for this study of symmetries, um, we need to, like what we're curious about so that we can then reason about if I apply this symmetry transformation, I shouldn't have the underlying data change. Uh, we need to be very explicit about how these groups, how these transformations affect the data that's located in the domain. So uh, we can start off by saying that there is this concept of a group action, which applies a group transformation on a uh, element of the domain. So for some group element G and a domain element U, it applies the symmetry G on the domain element U. This can be equivalent to translating or rotating an image or permuting a set. So you take uh, pixel U and when you apply G to it, the U will actually shift to its neighboring position or something like that. We will typically be only interested in group actions that are linear, that allow us to push in the group action as deeply as possible, as you can see in the example in the middle. We'll see why linearity is enough uh, in a few slides time. What's very nice about linear group actions, first of all, is that uh, as long as we're in a discrete space and our, uh, you know, our feature functions are actually just matrices, Linear, uh, linear group action can be also then represented in the language of linear algebra. So there's this row function that takes a particular symmetry transformation and gives you an n by n matrix describing the effect of that group transformation, such that we can basically stay in the language of linear algebra the whole time. And this will simplify things a lot when we move to, for example, the graph domain. But for now, the thing you need to know is that we're looking at how groups act on data in the domain. We're going to restrict ourselves to linear actions of data in the domain. And if we're doing that, we can represent the symmetry transformation using its group action row of G, which is just a matrix that when multiplied by our features will have the effect of applying that group action. Once we have that, we can finally define what it is that we want. Like if we know there are some symmetries in G and uh, we want, if we apply the symmetry for our neural network or any other function to give us exactly the same answer, irrespective of whether we transform the input in this way, then uh, we would really much like this concept of G invariance. So we have a symmetry group G and we say that a function F is G invariant if the output of the function is the same regardless of whether or not I applied the group action to the features. So F of uh, rho of G of X is the same as F of X. Like the output is unaffected by the group action. So this is the first 
fifth very important principle. And it says, if I shift an image, I still want my classifier to give me exactly the same class. Um, uh, we also might be interested on outputs that are not global. So in the case of image classification, you get one prediction per entire image, but you might also want to do image segmentation, right? Where every single pixel should be classified by which object it belongs to. And there invariance is actually not quite what you need. You actually uh, would much rather have this notion of equivariance where, uh, okay, applying the group action will now change my output. Like the pixels will just end up in a different place, but I want to still be able to identify which output node belongs to which input node. So what we're saying there is that the group action will not affect the uh, output in a, in a different way other than just being applied to its output. So if I have a group action row of G, it doesn't matter if I apply it before or after applying the function. So what this means is in the case of image segmentation, we're expecting that our segmentation mask should follow any shifts in the input. So if I shift the input before applying my segmenter, I should get the same result as if I first apply my segmenter, then shift the predictions. So that's the key idea of equivariance, which gives us a slightly more granular way of reasoning about functions that uh, might give us a wider space of applications compared to just invariance. Now, these two terms already take us a lot of the way there, like very close to what we want. But there's another aspect that, uh, you know, real world data is inherently quite noisy. And, uh, you know, not everything that happens to the input is going to be a nice symmetry of the ground truth uh, input information. There could also be operations that slightly distort the input or deform it or something else. So here we have this example of a house where uh, if you shift it, you will still end up with exactly the same representation of the house. And that's like on this group uh, ring G. But you might also be interested in transformations like this tau that's highlighted in the plot that uh, doesn't uh, keep the image exactly the same, like distorts it a little bit, but you should still be able to identify that this thing is the house. Like you shouldn't, uh, your output shouldn't drastically change just because I distorted it a little bit and drifted from the group. So what we derive in our work is that to achieve this, it's highly beneficial to compose local operations uh, that like have a local uh, area of effect to model larger scale interactions. Because if you immediately do large scale interactions, a small perturbation, a small distortion anywhere will propagate everywhere in your result. Whereas if your uh, neural network layers, for example, are super, super local, then a tiny change in one position will not greatly propagate everywhere else. So basically, this is the reason why in convolution neural networks, you'd start with very small kernels, like three by three, but make them very, very deep so that the effects propagate. So what we get as a result as a desideratum, and we have, a, we will show a detailed like proof of uh, why this is useful. It will be very useful for us to support locality in our layers. And uh, if you come from a more signal processing background, you might also uh, like the analogy of Fourier transforms versus wavelets. Both of these things are going to be completely invariant to the symmetries that you chose. However, these Fourier transforms, you can see these sine waves and cosine waves, they have complete support over the entire domain. So the moment I change, distort anything in my input, I'm going to have error that propagates everywhere. And that's not very geometric stable, whereas wavelets also express the full signal, but are far more peaky and are actually zero in most of the input space. So as a result, if I make a small distortion somewhere, it's not going to drastically affect my entire prediction. So using these two guiding principles, invariances and symmetries, and uh, scale separation and locality, we can now derive what we call the blueprint of geometric deep learning. And I've listed here some of the key building blocks that we might want to consider here. And I will like, rather than going through them one at a time, I'll kind of highlight them and say what, it, what they are. So first, the two elements that we described, we might be interested in doing uh, equivariant layers that transform the domain in a way that is consistent with the group actions, but still leaves us an entry in every single element of our domain. And ideally we'd want them to be local. So as long as our equivariant layer isn't global, any distortions will not propagate too far away. So the output of this equivariant function in a particular point of the domain will only depend over some local neighborhood of that particular point. 
in the sense of symmetric over omega. And also, if you're interested in predictions over the entire domain, you can also use this G invariant operator at the end, which uh, actually some papers like CNNs and so on will refer to as a global pooling operation. So something that will take the entire domain and invariantly pull it into a, a flat representation. Now, the reason why I said it is uh, enough for us to focus just on linear group actions and like these linear equivariant operators is partly, you know, that's very useful for us because then we can look at everything through the realm of group actions, but also because in deep learning, we can get away with plugging nonlinearities just completely separately. And that is by using these activation functions like ReLU or Tant or something like that. So basically we can do our equivariant layer and then apply a nonlinearity independently in every single point. And, uh, you know, in deep learning, this is quite necessary. And if we add these two ingredients together, we can express uh, most nonlinear functions. In fact, uh, you know, you can derive universal approximation theorems for variants of the architectures that we will propose here. And finally, uh, something that I won't cover in this talk in detail, but it follows from this principle of locality and is certainly useful in some applications like image classification. It's, it might be useful sometimes, especially as you gradually work your way to a whole domain prediction, especially if the domain is huge, like large images. It can be useful to, from time to time, make your input images uh, smaller. So this is what this local pooling or downsampling operation can achieve. And uh, it essentially uh, corresponds to going from a domain omega j uh, to a domain omega j plus one, which is strictly contained within the initial one. And this allows you to kind of pool your initial domain and preserve uh, the most important parts while making the domain smaller. And all of these things combined together. So equivariant layers that uh, uh, act on the individual elements in a way that respects equivariance to the symmetry group, local pooling layers that uh, course in the domain, invariant global tails, if you want to have a prediction on the level of the entire input, and random nonlinearities spliced within this blueprint is, as we will see very soon, pretty much all you need to build the architectures that are all you need. Um, in fact, if you use this generic idea and you make the right choice of symmetry groups and domains, you can actually derive all of the fan favorites. So convolutions, spherical CNNs, GNNs, deep sets, transformers, and even some interesting things in the middle, like uh, neural networks operating over manifolds, which, are, which may, may have received a bit less attention than some of these. They're all derived as instances of our blueprint if you stick the right domain and the right symmetry group. So we hope that this principle of uh, invariance, uh, equivariance, and uh, geometric stability can actually uh, lead us to categorize deep learning in a way that will, from one hand, give us a nice way to observe the field as it is now, but from another hand, also let us uh, more easily process new architectures as they are devised in the future. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's talk about these five Gs of geometric deep learning. So how different parts of deep learning fit within this blueprint that I just told you. Time permitting, uh, we will go through all five of them. So uh, grids, which correspond to data like images and time series, uh, groups, which correspond to homogeneous groups such as spheres, graphs, which correspond to data such as molecules, and geodesics and gauges, which kind of together form this idea of learning over meshes and manifolds. Uh, I will not cover these in an order of uh, exposition, uh, in the order of generality, uh, but I decided to kind of go through them in a way that allows us to have a more easier conversational style. So the order in which we will cover these is we will actually start with graphs because uh, they being purely discrete objects with a very simple permutation symmetry will be the ideal target for illustrating and concretizing some of the stuff that I just mentioned previously. Then, uh, assuming we have enough time, I will go through grids, which, I mean, just result in standard convolutional neural networks. So it's the example that should be closest to you. Uh, I will rather use grids uh, to link all of these concepts to concepts like Fourier analysis and spectral analysis. Then we will take the efforts to take the image convolution and see how it can be cast as an instance of our blueprint and how just by swapping out the domain and swapping out the symmetry group, we can then go from image convolutions on grids to more general group convolutions, for example, on spheres. 
And finally, uh, given that this requires a very thorough introduction to differential geometry, and it's not something that I aim to cover within the space of a talk, uh, I will very briefly and visually illustrate what is necessary to take all these concepts and generalize them to manifolds, so geodesics and gauges. So without further ado, uh, let's start with graphs. And I'll actually start with an even simpler case case, I will assume that we have a graph with no edges. So our domain is just a set of nodes. Uh, this unordered set learning setup is still highly impactful for things like point clouds and the like. So it's definitely worthwhile to study it. And we will assume that uh, our features are given in each one of our nodes. So xi is a k-dimensional real vector that gives us the features of node i. And we can then, as we commonly do, stack them into a node feature matrix of shape n by k. And the i-th row of that matrix will give us the features of the i-th set element. One very important thing to note is that by doing this, we have actually specified an ordering of the nodes. And uh, we would ideally like the result of any neural network operation to not depend on this node ordering. So this is uh, a very great example of our symmetry blueprint. And let's see how it maps. And we will see that it maps very easily to what we described before. Specifically, it can be quite useful to think about what are the operations that change the order of the nodes. And as you probably know, these operations are known as permutations. There's n factorial, many of them for n elements. And uh, we can actually completely stay within linear algebra. Each permutation just defines an n by n matrix. Here you can see the example of this permutation matrix for the permutation 2413. And you can see it has exactly one one in every row and column and zeros everywhere else. And the only effect it has is that when you left multiply it with the node features, it will permute the, the node features. That's it, nothing else will happen. So these matrices perfectly illustrate the operations that we want to be resistant to. And uh, if you remembered all that uh, talk I said about group actions previously, if we look at our symmetry group as the permutation group of n elements, their group actions are exactly these n by n permutation matrices. So that kind of links back to the, the blueprint of invariances and equivariances. And like the blueprint pretty much directly tells us what to do in this case. Like we can say that a function over sets is useful in the sense of permutation and variance. If no matter what permutation matrix I apply to the inputs, I should still get exactly the same result. So f of px is equal to f of x for all permutation matrices. And uh, one generic form of a neural network model that you might have seen that satisfies this is the deep sets model, which applies an independent transformation psi in every node in isolation, then applies a sum aggregation to combine all these nodes into one flat embedding, and then applies potentially another transformation phi to uh, resolve the final uh, outcome. And these psi and phi can be learnable functions like MLPs. And the part which gives it the permutation invariance is this notion of summing over all the nodes, which is a permutation invariant aggregator. But we can also slot different choices of aggregator there, such as maximization or averaging. And the, the concepts still remain the same. The outcome of this summing will be the same no matter how I permute uh, my inputs. Now, as we said before, permutation and variance is a good way to get outputs over the whole domain. But what if I want answers on the level of individual nodes? Well, uh, this summing operation could destroy all the individual nodes' identities, and that would make it quite tricky. So instead, we might care about functions that don't change the order of the nodes. So that leads us once again to permutation equivariance and following exactly the blueprint we said before. It doesn't matter if I apply my permutation matrix before or after uh, applying my set level neural network. So this seems like a very promising uh, idea. And look. Looking at our geometric deep learning blueprint, we can actually come up with a very generic way of just learning on sets as a whole. Specifically, uh, this equivariance uh, requires us to not change any of the nodes rows by f. And that means that we can think of all equivariant set functions as just transforming every input independently using this shared psi function into a latent vector hi. It will from time to time be useful for us to rather than look at all the nodes outputs at once, look at the output on the level of a single node hi. And uh, then we can stack the HIs into an H matrix, which is the output of F of X. And this actually gives us a very general blueprint. So if you stack equivariant functions over the individual nodes and then follow up with some invariant tail at the end, if you need an output over the entire set, 
This, in the language of our deep learning blueprint, actually gives you most, if not all, useful functions over sets. And here, this O plus, whenever you see the O plus, is just any permutation variant aggregation, such as summing, averaging, or max. And one important remark here is that this is typically as far as we can get with pure sets. Like anything more than that, like graph neural networks or transformers and so on, will require us to assume or infer some additional structure in the set. So here I'm assuming no edges are given to me between the nodes, and I'm not assuming any edges will ever exist. So this is a very important distinction. But now that we've done this, it becomes so much more easier to transition from sets to graphs. Like what we're going to do is we're just going to add some additional edges between our nodes. So the subset of the Cartesian product of nodes with themselves. And we typically can represent that as an adjacency matrix A, such that the IJ element of this adjacency matrix is one in the entries that have uh, edges and zero everywhere else. You could do more things. Obviously in learning on graphs, it's exciting to try adding edge features, graph features, and these kinds of things. But for simplicity, we ignore them, and the math ends up being pretty much the same, only with a few extra inputs. And in this setting, nothing has really changed. We still want to be invariant and equivariant to permutations because we want two isomorphic graphs to map to the same outcomes. And uh, this uh, uh, basically uh, gives rise to the notion of permutation invariance and equivariance on graph structure data which very much looks like the one we did for sets. The only difference is that now when I permute my nodes, I must also accordingly permute the edges. So the adjacency matrix is uh, an N by N matrix, which uh, where both the rows and the columns correspond to the main elements. So permuting the nodes means that I must now permute both the rows and the columns of the adjacency matrix which in terms of linear algebra corresponds to doing PAP transposed. And this then gives us equivalent definitions of invariant and equivariant functions over graphs, such that once again, for invariance, if I permute the nodes and accordingly permute the edges, I should get the same result. For equivariance, if I permute the nodes and edges, it doesn't matter if I do it before or after applying the function. So, this is a very generic uh, space of functions and over graphs, there's a lot more possible solutions. So it might be useful for us to just think about, can we maybe introduce some more constraints to just make the search for a good graph layer more useful? And we will conclude that on sets, we have enforced locality by applying the functions to every node in isolation. And uh, with graphs, we have potentially a better way to enforce locality and hence geometric stability because we can look at a node's immediate neighborhood, right? So we can look at all the nodes that are connected to a node by an edge, and this gives us NI, the neighborhood of node I. And uh, it's typically defined as the set of all uh, incident uh, nodes, J, that are linked to I with an edge. And uh, once we have the notion of neighborhoods, we can also look at all the features that are located in the neighborhood, and that's something that I denote X and I. So that's the set of all X, J vectors, where J is a neighbor of I. And now I can define a local function that operates over this multiset. So something that takes the features of node i and the entire set of features in the neighborhood and updates the features of node i based on this locality. So this then gives us a very nice recipe for graph neural networks because we can now construct permutations equivariant functions, F, by applying this local function G on all the neighborhoods in isolation and then just stacking the results into a node feature matrix. There's one other thing we need to do to make sure that F is equivariant, and that's we need to make sure that uh, the output of G doesn't depend on the order in which I feed these neighbors in X and I. So as a result, G should be chosen to be permutation invariant. Now, I know that, like, Explaining this with a lot of maths may not necessarily intuitively click for everyone. And uh, I thought it would be much more easy for myself and for everyone else if I also provide a figure. So here is a figure that explains everything that we have just done. I have given you a recipe for constructing good neural networks over graphs. It's not the full space of possible solutions for equivariance, but it's one that uh, certainly satisfies the locality properties. Uh, by just learning this function G that looks at features of a node and the features of its immediate neighbors and updates the features. And then you can just sharedly apply that function in every single node's neighborhood and get updated representations as a result. 
And once you have that, you can then ask yourself, how do I use GNNs? Well, let's say I start with a graph that has node features in every node, XI, and I have some adjacency information. I run my GNN as described over it that will update my node's features uh, based on the immediate neighborhood of every node, giving me these latent vectors, HI, in every single one of my nodes. And uh, then assuming I want to classify nodes, I can just learn a classifier in every node individually, keeping my uh, layer completely equivariant. If I want to classify entire graphs, I need to somehow aggregate them into a graph level representation. So attach this previously mentioned uh, G invariant tail to the end of my graph neural network. And uh, it, I could also classify interesting stuff in links. And for this uh, link prediction or edge classification setting, I can learn a classifier that looks at the features of the two nodes and any edge features that I might have uh, between them. So this is kind of a quick overview of all the interesting stuff you can do over graphs once you uh, have a reasonably learned GNN. And uh, you might be asking, how do I actually define this function G? And uh, in practice, what we found by our exploration is that in most cases, interesting GNN layers will conform to one of these three spatial flavors, the convolutional, the attentional, and the message passing. And I've given just a quick overview of the data flow and uh, all the equations. Uh, I think I should have, oh, actually, yeah, so I don't have uh, more slides explaining this in this particular talk, but uh, basically um, in the convolutional setting, we predefine what's the coefficient of interaction between neighbors, this CIG which we set up front. In the attentional, we actually don't preset it. We let it be learnable as a result of an attention function. And in the message passing flavor, we um, actually have the sender and the receiver node coordinate to decide the message vector that gets sent across an edge. All three of these satisfy the blueprint that I showed you before. And they don't cover every possible equivariant function over graphs, but they definitely cover 90% or more of the layers that are being proposed nowadays. And uh, like I could have made this entire talk be about GNNs, given that they're a bit of a specialty of mine, but I actually wanted to spend more time to show you just how applicable this blueprint is uh, across the spectrum of interesting domains. So if graph neural networks are new newish to you and you'd like to learn a bit more about foundations, I recently gave a really good talk that was uh, focusing just on these foundations. So. Basically, if you want just to learn about GNNs, GNNs applications and where they can be applied, this talk is like a super fast condensed way of uh, going through several years of history of GNN design. And I would recommend taking a look at that if you're interested. But uh, unfortunately for the purposes of this talk, I cannot really focus on GNNs that much more and I will move on to some of the other domains. So uh, moving on to grids, which is the second domain that we're going to consider. And I mean, the first question is what's changed? If you look at images, text, and speech, you can still see them as graphs, right? You can think of pixels being connected to their immediate neighbors in the image grid. And uh, you could just think about applying a graph neural network over them. So here in the case of grids, applying a graph neural network just amounts to applying a message passing over the two immediate neighbors of every node. Note that I've added the cyclical link from the first node to the last node just to sort of simplify the boundary conditions. In principle, this cyclical condition is not necessary. And uh, But by adding it, basically every node now has an identical structure and degree. Like if you look at the individual points on this grid, all of them locally look the same structurally, right? Each one of them has a left neighbor and a right neighbor. And what this means is that now I can, in a far more principled way, define a convolution over this neighborhood. And also, uh, usually in grids, uh, coordinates might actually be important. So we can get a much stronger requirement. For graphs, we just had permutation equivariance. Here we have translation equivariance. So nodes actually correspond to positions and shifts do a very meaningful transformation of the coordinates. It's not just a random permutation of these, uh, these inputs. So let's rethink how we look at convolutions on sequences. Uh, as before, we can think of a sequence as this cyclical grid graph. And in each node of the grid, we have some features, xi. And a convolution, as you might be familiar, looks at a node and its immediate neighbors, multiplies them by some fixed constant, depending on whether it's the left neighbor or the right neighbor. And as a result, computes some linear combination. And that gives you the features h in that particular node. 
And if you expand this out into a matrix operation, you will realize that this ABC filter defines a very special kind of filter known as a circulant matrix, which has this very nice uh, shifty diagonal structure where at every subsequent row, you take the previous row and you shift it by one to the right. If you take a matrix like this and you apply it to your inputs, you can convince yourselves that uh, we're exactly doing a convolution operation. Now, circulants are super nice matrices to analyze. They have some very nice properties. Uh, first of all, they commute. So no matter which parameters I stick into two circulants, it doesn't matter what's the order in which I perform them, I will still get the same result. And when two matrices commute, it's a standard result in linear algebra that you can jointly diagonalize them, which means that if you find eigenvectors for one of them, you found eigenvectors for all of them. And very conveniently, one popular circulant matrix is the shift matrix, which just shifts the input one step to the right. And uh, as you might know from digital signal processing, the eigenvectors of this particular matrix are exactly the discrete Fourier transform. So basically, these discrete Fourier vectors are going to be the basis for every single circulant circulant matrix, regardless of what's the feature vector inside them. And this is a very convenient property. So you can stack all of these Fourier basis vectors into a matrix and recover basically what is known as the discrete Fourier transform. Like you can represent the discrete Fourier transform as a multiplication of a signal of your over your grid with these uh, previously computed eigenvectors of the grid. And this also allows you, because all circulants will have exactly the same eigenvectors, which is this matrix of DFT uh, vectors, you can eigen decompose any circulant using this matrix. So any circulant, no matter what feature vector I put, uh, weight vector I put into them, will decompose as the DFT times a matrix of eigenvalues times the DFT uh, conjugate transposed. And from there, you can derive some pretty sweet results, such as the convolution theorem. You might have heard about this. Convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain. The main idea is that my convolution, which is a multiplication of a circulant matrix with my input signal, can be decomposed as the DFT times the eigenvalues times the DFT conjugate transpose times the signal. And if I pre-compute this uh, transform with phi star, which takes me into the Fourier domain, now suddenly applying my filter, which is just specified by these eigenvalues, is a pointwise multiplication with the resulting signal. So once again, as long as we know the discrete Fourier transform, and we can compute that if we know the shape of our grid, we can express our convolutions just by specifying its eigenvalues with respect to this basis. That completely specifies every circulant matrix that we can ever come up with. So it's worth taking a step back and seeing what is it that we've actually done here. We've shown how, okay, familiarly in the spatial domain, our image convolutions are just a multiplication by a circulant. That shouldn't come as a big surprise. But we've also found a very strong correspondence between Fourier analysis in the sense that I can take my discrete Fourier transform to take my features into the, the spectral domain. And there I can apply the same convolution just by pointwise multiplying it with appropriately picked eigenvalues. And then if I wanna go back to the spatial domain, I can multiply it with the inverse Fourier transform and go back to where I am. Note that this diagram commutes. So I don't actually need to know the circulant matrix to apply a convolution. I can just go to the spectral domain, do the pointwise multiply, then go back to the spatial domain. It's a very interesting idea and basically boils down to if I know the eigenvalues of the circulant, I don't need to know the circulant itself. And this hopefully gives a nice link uh, in the grid domain where it's the easiest to analyze, uh, a nice analog of Fourier analysis that we can use over many domains. And uh, variants of this have been used in graphs as well, although there the problem is that not every graph adjacency matrix will have exactly the same uh, eigen decomposition, so things get a bit more complicated there. Okay. So now that we've elucidated this link, uh, let's try to take our image convolution and try to apply it to something that's a little bit more general, but still homogeneous. So um, 
to kind of segue into what we're about to do, we're going to consider a continuous grid. So rather than looking at the discrete grid, we're looking at the Euclidean domain of just real number uh, coordinates. And in this setting, as you might be aware, convolution can be computed as the inner product between uh, the signal and uh, a filter, which is shifted by a particular value, uh, u. Uh, integrated over all possible uh, such uh, points. And um, basically, uh, this output of a grid convolution gives you another function on the grid. But this, is, this only worked because we were able to integrate overall shifts, and shifts themselves can be represented as a real number. Like, it's just a number telling you how much you're shifting. But actually, for more general domains, applying a convolution of this form will not give you a signal over the same domain. So let's see how we might generalize it to a more general uh, group. So we will look at previously what happened over grids. Here you have the version of the equation for grids at the top. And uh, let's see how we can generalize this to groups by recalling that we can define inner products over any domain omega as long as I have a metric over that domain. So the principle should still be the same, right? With image convolutions, I uh, did an inner product of my features with appropriately shifted uh, signal um, filters. Here, I'm going to do a convolution of my features with an appropriately group transformed filter. So previously, like on images, the group transforms were exactly shifts. Now it's some arbitrary group action that corresponds to the symmetries that we're expecting in our data. But you know the integrals end up largely looking the same. The only difference is that now uh, you cannot say for sure that there's a plus operation here. You just have to do the inverse of whatever that group was doing to compute the group integral. But one thing that's very important is that here the inputs to the convolution were shifts and those were also real numbers. So it worked for us. Here, the inputs to a convolution are a transformation. So the output function of performing a group convolution is not a function over the initial domain. It's a function over the elements of the symmetry group. This is a very important point. In grids, this was OK, because the symmetry group is itself the set of real numbers, just scalar shifts. But here, the symmetry group could be something more complicated. And uh, well, let's see how that works out on a natural example. So let's imagine that we want to do convolutions over spheres, which is something a little bit more general than images and still has a lot of relevance, like many signals in astrophysics are defined uh, over a sphere. So our input domain is now uh, the set of uh, three-dimensional unit vectors u, giving us different coordinates on the sphere. And what we want is for this uh, output any, of any function over the sphere to be rotation equivariant. So no matter how I rotate the sphere, the output should still like transform in the same way. And that means that our transformation group is no longer shifts. It's now the uh, special group SO3, which uh, is represented by rotation matrices. So one particular rotation of the sphere can be represented in three dimensions by a three by three matrix that is orthogonal. And if we plug that into the uh, group uh, signature, which I've copied on the top right corner for kind of uh, clarity, we basically get that our group convolution over uh, spherical signals gives us a function that's defined over three by three matrices. So previously we had a function defined over points on the sphere. Our output gives us a value in every single three by three matrix. And we once again, integrate over the surface of the sphere and apply the right inverse transformation. Once again, because it's a three by three orthogonal rotation matrix, we can invert it by just applying the opposite rotation. So this gives us uh, a way to generalize the image convolution to spheres. And there are ways in which we can efficiently compute this integral, uh, which is out of scope for this talk, but the principles are what's more important here. But now the problem is uh, the output of this spherical convolution gives you a function over all the rotations, over all the rotation matrices. So in deep learning land, what we really would like to do is stack more layers, but the next convolutional layer is not the same as the one we just defined because it's not anymore over the sphere. We need to now define a convolution over the group of rotations itself. And what's very fun and very useful in this setting is that our blueprint still works perfectly because every group G 
can itself be acted on by G by just having the group action be a, a transformation composition. So if I have one rotation matrix, I can act on it with a different rotation matrix by just composing the two rotations. And that's perfectly fine. So the group action that we have then, like applying a particular group action over the function defined over groups, is the same as that function defined over the inverse group action over the initial. And consequently, this means that no matter what symmetry group G we have, we can build G equivariant layers over G. And that's basically a layer we can just replicate from now on. So our spherical convolutional neural network starts with the previously mentioned convolution over the sphere and then stacks SO3 convolutions over SO3 until we're satisfied that we have enough information to classify the whole sphere. So this is just a quick way in which you can use the blueprint once again to compute a two-layer spherical CNN. So uh, basically, if you assume this first uh, convolutional layer to act over the original signal on the sphere with a filter defined over three by three matrices, I can then define another layer that looks at a filter phi that looks at a different rotation matrix, integrates over the SO3 group and applies the inverse group action as before. And this general concept forms the essence of spherical CNNs, which uh, was uh, created by one of the co-authors of this work and actually received the best paper award at uh, iClear 2018. So it's a super interesting paper, a lot of interesting details, not just about the math, but also about how to implement these things. But just to show how with the simple blueprint that we previously proposed, we can end up with some super interesting and intricate layers um, defined over uh, geometric inputs, such as spheres. And uh, this sounds wonderful, right? If we can make G equivalent layers over G, that means I can define a convolution over pretty much anything as long as I define a good symmetry group. But there's a few caveats here. Uh, even though it works like in principle, it's only tractable if the group is very small, right? Because we had this SO3 convolution. I had to store a value for every three by three orthogonal matrix that I care about in my filter bank. And this is obviously a problem if I want to, for example, move to graphs, because for graphs, you have to be symmetric to the permutation group, which has n factorial many entries. So, you know, there exists these super complicated graph convolutions that would store a value in every individual permutation and then do equivariant layers over those permutation entries, but no computer could ever be expected to actually store that much information. So basically this hints that there exist very interesting quote unquote graph convolutions that fit under the geometric deep learning blueprint. And they're not captured by our simple, let's just look at the one hop neighborhood and that's it flavor. But it does likely capture the ones that are most efficient to compute on a computer. So just to keep in mind, this is a very attractive blueprint, but the moment your group becomes more complicated than like simple rotations, it's typically tricky to implement. And the second very important caveat with what we've just done on the spheres is that both spheres and grids are homogeneous. And that means that all points sort of locally look the same. So no matter what two points I pick on my sphere, there exists some symmetry that will take one point to the other. This does not have to hold in more general geometric domains. Graphs, for example, do not have this property. And the fact that we had this property allowed us to define this one filter around the particular point and then slide it across the sphere to build a convolution or slide it across the grid to build a CNN. But what can we do in the case that is more general, like if our points don't all locally look the same? And that leads us to the final part of this talk, which concerns geodesics and gauges. So more generally, we might be interested in things that are not at all homogeneous and are actually manifold and like have very different structure in different parts of the surface. So like these human poses here, these like I shouldn't have to highlight that manifolds are highly relevant for things like uh, computer graphics, uh, protein design, fMRI processing. All of these things can be represented as meshes that get, specify a surface. Um, we defer detailed exposition and theory to the draft that I will link at the end, but I will give you a flavor for how we might make this happen. So basically, we can now define our domain omega to be just a manifold. Here, I've still used the sphere because it's just easier to think about it on a sphere, but you can imagine this to be much more complicated. 
And uh, the key concept is this idea of parallel transport. So if I've defined a filter that is local to a particular point, I could also apply it to a different point, but I must first apply an operation to translate this filter and transport it to a different location in the domain. And one very important thing about these parallel transported filters is that the filter you get is dependent on the path you take to reach a particular point. So here, if I have a filter defined in my point A, which points tangentially to the point A, if I transport it to point C directly using the geodesic distance, it will give me uh, uh, an arrow that points uh, outwards from the sphere. But if uh, instead I first transport it to a point B and then from point B transport it to a point C, I will get a vector that points completely differently. So that's a very important point to note, which complicates things a bit further in this realm. And uh, with some caveats, you can use parallel transport to define what it means to slide a filter along a more general surface. So say you have this uh, sculpture that you want to apply a filter over. Uh, I could feasibly transport that filter to the right ear by just carrying it across the surface on the right. And eventually it might look something like what I've drawn here. But I could also feasibly take it first to the head and then slide it down to the ear, which uh, gives me a completely different oriented filter. So once again, the final thing that I get is path dependent. So I have to be very careful on how exactly I define sliding a filter and how exactly I do it. But it is possible to do it. And there have been several tractable layers that have been proposed. If you're interested to find out more, some of the earlier works like the geodesic CNN uh, that were published at CVPR 2015. And the most recent that was published at iClear 2021, so this year, is the gauge equivariant mesh CNN, which uh, tries to use this parallel transport idea and kind of unite it together with the concepts of message passing over meshes. So uh, basically, with all of these together, we have summarized this geometric deep learning blueprint. And uh, we have actually just now released a website, geometricdeeplearning.com, where you can find the paper uh, that we currently have. It's a 150 page long proto book describing all these ideas in much greater detail and linking many other architectures to the blueprint. So if you're interested, you can give it a read right now. I will highlight that we're not very broadly sharing it until tonight when the archive will also become public. But until then, if you're interested to take a read and uh, check out how we implement this blueprint in practice, I would recommend uh, taking a look there. Um, that was actually the last slide I had. So uh, I would like to thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to present a talk like this at Erlangen. and. Um, I hope that I have given uh, the Erlangen program uh, its justice when it comes to being mapped to uh, deep learning. And uh, I hope that you, uh, I hope to uh, have some interesting conversations with you in the time we have left. So if you have any questions or any feedback, please let me know either here or uh, you can feel free to email me directly. I also have some social network presence, which is uh, located on this uh, Pitara V website. Once again, great thanks to all of my collaborators, John, Michael, and Taco, who have uh, co developed this write up with me. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to uh, stay for a little while and uh, talk about some aspects of this work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I do have some applause for you. So I hope you can hear that. So if you were here in person, we would be knocking on the table. And <laughs> so I have a short recording of that. So thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. And also thank you for essentially giving the presentation on the release day of your book. So that's also a great honor for us that you select uh, this day exactly for releasing the book. So really cool. And I'm very much looking forward to reading it. And also there are some questions in the chat. And one thing that now you, know, you have these invariances and it's essentially the invariances give rise to layers and operations in a network. Do you also have an idea how you select the, the sequence of the invariances? Is this independent or can they can they be learned? Or what kind of ideas do you have about that? Uh, so in terms of, I, I guess, maybe could you clarify a bit what you mean by uh, sequences of invariances in the sense that different layers might have different invariances or something like exactly. this? 
exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the inception blocks, you, you run them in parallel and then you just unite them or is there mm -hmm. a better approach to that? Do we, do we still need inception like ideas? Hmm. That's a very good point. And uh, so basically, I guess I would say a few things. There are some cases where you indeed need to kind of compose different invariances. One example we give in our book is the processing DNA sequences, where there's a translation invariance over the DNA strand, but you might know the DNA has this double helix structure where you actually don't know which of the two strands you're reading. So you could be reading the first strand from the start, or you could be reading the second strand, which is a complement from the end. So you would actually like the output of your neural network to not depend on reverse complemented sequences, which has to be combined with translations. And it turns out that in this case, at least mathematically, it is equivalent if you choose to apply these two transformations separately, like one after the other. First, uh, do the translational uh, convolution, like the style of CNNs, and then do another group convolution, which is dependent on a zero one flip. Do I reverse complement this sequence or not? And uh, with these two, you can actually like, basically it doesn't, we've shown that it doesn't matter that much in what order you do them mathematically, but mathematically is one thing and in practice is a completely other thing. So I would actually imagine that, you know, inception style options are probably going to be quite attractive different ways, like basically we provide the building blocks. We don't necessarily prescribe how to combine the building blocks. And uh, I feel like that can be a very interesting follow-up work. I guess I will say that our book is still a proto book. Like it's only 150 pages of the main kind of conversational ideas, but this is a very useful point. Like, thanks Andreas. We will be definitely thinking about what are the meaningful ways in which these have been composed. Um, but yeah, like I don't, we don't, uh, I'll just say we don't propose a good principled way of doing this. Uh, I, I feel like neural network designers and hyperparameter tuners still have a lot of, long way to go before we can give a good advice <laughs> on that front. Yeah, but, I mean, partially it may come out of the data and the problem that you're looking at. So that's the inductive bias, right? Yeah. That you, that you already know about the problem. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. And also by mathematical design, you could show that it doesn't matter which of the two operations you apply first. Yeah. So that's also a very clear guidance. Mm -hmm. But maybe still people um, finding papers that there may be numerical advantages of doing the one before the other. Mm -hmm. So quite interesting. Uh, just one one thing about the spherical CNNs. Uh, do, do, do you have an intuition about the application? Where, where is this being used? Uh, so I don't know if I can give you any examples where it's actually being like deployed right now, but uh, many signals that you get from like astrophysics are basically, you know, signals that come from telescopes. There are different points on the, on the earth. So the signal is like spread across a sphere, usually like cosmic microwave background radiation and these kinds of signals are naturally mappable to, to spheres. So, and also, I mean, uh, world maps, for example, like if you want to do any kind of map over the surface of the earth, well, it's not exactly a sphere, but a sphere is a pretty good approximation. And certainly if you do the more standard projection that we do in maps, right, which kind of spreads out the north and the south pole, applying a CNN over that has been shown to be suboptimal to just applying a spherical CNN over the signal. So these are some motivating examples. Are people actually using it in practice? I guess basically there's a huge, uh, there's a very interesting gap here between how, what's the effect you get from having good invariances and symmetries and what's just the effect from doing good data augmentation, right? Yeah. So we don't typically design convolution nets to be invariant to rotations, but we often, when we data augment our image net classifiers, we will rotate the images a tiny bit, right? So there's also a way to kind of just through transforming the data, get some interesting desirable invariance properties communicated to the neural network without forcing it to respect it. And there's always a question of how does data augmentation compare against some of these approaches? And uh, I think in the case of spheres, maybe still like a very well thought out image data augmentation, which is mindful of the group symmetries could be competitive to an inductive bias. But, you know, uh, the, the belief is that once we get good at efficiently implementing some of these layers, we can just do equivariant neural networks and not worry about data augmentation at all, because you get symmetries for free if you do this. Exactly. I mean, to some point, the data augmentation just causes that you essentially explore all of the different possibilities. And then you learn the same thing over and over again, but in a different orientation. So it just blows up the number of parameters without increasing the actual knowledge gained, right? So yeah. Very, very, very interesting. So there's one more question that just came up. Um, 
You relate symmetry groups to different architectures following the idea of the Erlang program. Are the basic properties of these architectures problems you see related to the properties of the symmetry groups, so the solvability, if the group is abelian, um, finitely generated? Mm -hmm. so. so there is a there are some very like we go through a lot more detail on this in the book, but there are actually some very like there are cases where you specify a property that you want with respect to a symmetry group or an, an automorphism and you analyze what this would mean for a neural network layer and you get exactly the equation that somebody proposed 20 years ago for a neural network layer so i'll give one very sweet example which we have in the which we have in the book which concerns uh, lstms so for a very long time we had a problem squeezing recurrent neural networks into the blueprint because technically they operate on this temporal grid and it's not very easy to specify translation equivariance in this case and we've come across this super interesting paper that looks at time warping so uh, imagine that you have a discrete signal sampled over some points in time, but you know, your sampling may not be ideal, may not be regular. So your samples might come at regular points in time. Effectively, you're doing some kind of time warping operation on the underlying continuous time. And you would ideally want your class of RNNs to be resilient to such operations, right? If I give you a time dilated, time transformed uh, time series, my RNN class should still be able to fit that. So this notion of class invariance to time warping is super desirable. I should note this is as long as the derivative of the time warping is not bigger than one, because that would destroy some points. And at that point, you're hopeless. But as long as it doesn't destroy the underlying data, like you still receive all the data potentially at a different time, uh, then in this case, you derive that for your RN, there's a like simple one step Taylor expansion that you can do around this, uh, uh, around this uh, resulting function and the properties you want. And you relate that to satisfy this, your RNN layer must satisfy a differential equation of the output of the RNN layer times the derivative of the time warping with respect to the time. And as I said, uh, your time warping must be monotonic, so its derivative is bigger than zero, but also it shouldn't destroy anything about the input, so its derivative is smaller than one. So basically, you have a scalar between zero and one that must be learned, like you have to learn the derivative of the time warping while you're doing stuff, and it must be then multiplied with the output of your RNN. What have I just now described? I've described the gating mechanism. So the very motivation for the original long short-term memory and similar gated RNNs from Hochreiter and Schmidhuber can be related to the fact that we need to support uh, uh, time warping invariance of RNNs. So like by design, they're implementing this requirement. So just to say kind of there are, there are interesting links that you can get by, by studying the, the, the transformations that you want to be invariant to, and then like find links between the architectures. Uh, I'm not sure if this exactly answers your question, uh, Oliver, but uh, I found it to be very, uh, like your question motivated me to go off on this tangent. Yeah, yeah actually, this, as soon as you talk about inner projects, then of course, all the kernel theory pops up. So I guess you probably also discuss these points then in the book, or do you have some you, prob you probably have some closer insights into that as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, because the, the dy dynamic time warping and so on can also be used to construct kernels, right? Yeah, exactly. There is, uh, from time to time, we will discuss like kernel methods and how uh, different uh, equivariant operators can be expressed as basically a combination of certain kernels. This is particularly the case in spheres and uh, uh, geometric objects that behave similarly to spheres where uh, we draw derive these linkages to spherical harmonics and uh, the Winger D functions and so on. Like basically a lot more detail than uh, I can I can very easily convey to, to this group at this time. It's all in the book. But uh, basically, yes, we, we do draw links to kernels. They're often a nice way to uh, come up with a set of nice irreducible solutions to an equivariance uh, equation. So, yeah. Um, Peter, this was a super interesting talk. And I must admit, it. I'm really looking forward to reading the book. And maybe I can start even tonight because of the tonight's release date. Mm -hmm. And I thank you very much for the presentation. Really exciting. And also putting all of these different elements together was really a great overview of a current development. And of course, also chances where we can still link like classical theory and deep learning together and it's not like that we are in a completely independent field like some people 
talk about the, some of their ideas and you just have to do it right and you stir. It's good to see that there's also nice theoretic observations in there that explain a lot of the different approaches that we've been discovering in the past. So thank you very much. And I do have another round of applause for you. Peter, thanks very much for this inspiring talk. It's really very interesting to see how you can relate the different invariances to all the computational architectures that we have seen in deep learning. So really an inspiring talk and many important observations on how the different architectures can be composed. And I'm very much looking forward to reading your book soon. And we will also put the link into the description of this video. Obviously, the presentation has ended, our discussion has ended, but that doesn't mean that we have to end the discussion entirely. We are all very active in social media, so you can contact us. And of course, you can also leave comments in the comment section of this video, and I would forward them to Peter. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you very much and bye-bye.